Rip it off, Gino. So what we got? Uh, we got Jake and Gino here post just recording a podcast, and we decided to try to be, uh, break some technology today. So I'm going to mute that thing because I don't know what the hell it's doing. So <laughs> let's just let it go, Gino. Uh, so you want to talk about the Fed today a little bit and where we may be headed with inflation, what that means for future rates, and uh, and the like. So what you got, big boy? The Fed's raised rates ten times in the last fifteen months. They decided to take a pause. Maybe they should have raised rates a lot slower. What they're saying right now is inflation went from 9% last year down to 4%. So it appears that these rate hikes have slowed the economy down. They're, they're predicting GDP to be 1% at the end of the year. Can you imagine in any other administration, if you had said 1% GDP, people will be jumping off buildings and stuff. Meanwhile, this is like, ah, it's just another one of those. It's horrible. The economy is horrible right now. And no one's talking about that. We've been getting hammered with these prices that have been obscene. We've been getting hammered with wages that really aren't growing. And all people talk about is, oh, how well real estate's doing, how well some of these sectors are doing. And the Fed is partly to blame. We've had you know zero percent interest rates for like the last seven or eight years, which has really ramped up speculation. That's why the real estate market got so frothy. And in their infinite wisdom, they said, "Oh, inflation is transitory." Well, we know what how it wasn't transitory because it kept going. If you're in the real world and you're trying to grow a business, the media is transitory. All right, they wanted to not freak people out, so they're like, uh, "Let's just say this and see if folks chill out a little bit." Right. And Jake, before I let you, you take it over real quick, what I would really want to caution people is to think about the next meeting that the Fed's going to have in July. They're going to come up with any excuse. I think longer term rates are going to have to come down because if you have a thirty trillion dollar deficit. And if rates continue to go up, even if rates are 5%, 5% of 30 trillion or whatever they think is, you're talking of trillion dollars in, in interest payments alone. So it behooves them to really get this economy slowed down, to get inflation under control, because that's what the job of the Fed is, in just getting inflation under control. And I think longer term, right around the 2024 uh, presidential election season, right around there, they're going to want to have to drop rates because they want to juice that economy up so they can get their elected leader in office, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. That's been the playbook forever, and that's going to continue to be the playbook, Jake. I don't think it's going to be Joe Biden personally. I, I don't think you're going to see. Uh, I don't nope. think you're going to see Joey there uh, next time around. I, I would. Uh, I would put the money on Gavin Newsom. If, yep. If, uh, I was and, that and, man. And I don't think Trump's going to be there either. I think they're going to knock Trump out and it's going to be a wide open race for the Republicans. So that so, should be interesting. So th there was, this was not the intent to go there, but uh, I don't think the powers that be uh, are into uh, to Joey B right now. So think about this for a second. You, 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 you lock up Trump and then at the same time, you're like, kind of done with Biden, like pulling Andrew Cuomo on him right now. And he's going to be the next one with a document scandal and we'll get him out of there. So clean slate and uh, insert your next puppet. But uh, we're not talking about that today. So a few things on what you said a minute ago. Um, one, it, it's taking it, this has been a very uh, confused economy, right? It, there's been a ton of money sloshing around. So while you, your, your typical metrics where you'd say, hey, this is a down economy, well, there's still a lot of money sloshing around, so mm -hmm. that that's what's making it so confusing and and uh, distorted. You have, and that's you have the inflation money. piece. Yeah, you're talking, that's the inflation piece. Why inflation has continued to go along because people the, have money in the, the money. bank. That's yes. right. So so that's that's kind of uh, you know distorted everything uh, from a, a typical historical perspective, and that's why we're in this position now where it's like, well, we're in a recession, but are we really in a recession because there's so much money sloshing around? And uh, and I think what was it the the last numbers that came out for the year over year uh, inflation was a four percent four point one something like yep, that yeah it was down from so, nine percent last year down to four percent this year yes yeah and, and so my take on that is Powell keeps coming out and raising right but he he needed to see something like this and he's saying well there's going to be two more raises following this right is it, am I correct in saying that I think that's what he came out and said he said one or two raises yes right yeah. so so I do think for the first time in a long time this could be a bluff. Meaning that if if this if we continue on this trajectory, then he's saying that because he wants to see things tamp down. And if they yes. stay that way, it's going to be OK. If you see, you know, some some future inflation over the next few months that may then come into play. I think he's sort of in uh, he's running an option playing football, right? Like he may keep the ball and go with, but he may pitch it to the tailback as well. And I think what's happening right now and the reason he's saying that is he may not. But if if things continue to worsen uh, and, and inflation goes down, then maybe maybe this does not happen. And that's why it's such an interesting time to be investing in multifamily right now, because 
if you're going in and you're going to buy a deal and you're going to do any type of renovation, a loan to cost deal where you're, you're, you're you know, getting uh, money from the bank to do your, your repairs. Okay. You're going to pay a higher rate right now, but if you're buying the asset at a good price per unit, okay, your, your per door price is good. You go in, you buy the asset, you fix it up. In my opinion, in Gino's opinion, in the next two years, you're probably going to see some rate relief. So on the, the, the time that you're going to refi that after your, your construction loan, right? You get a, a five-year construction deal, maybe you hold it for two or three years. You should be then higher rates, uh, a more stabilized asset that's going into better debt, right? Maybe that doesn't happen, but that's sort of uh, the scenario that we're looking at. If it doesn't, though, we need it to be able to work on the current rates that are in place right now. So I, I think for folks that are out there saying, how should I be looking at deals? The way we're looking at deals right now, you know, one to two year turnaround period and uh, exiting with a, you know, hey, maybe it's five, maybe it's four and a half, but it's better than six or six and a half. So I would can make it work at six. We're in a great spot. I would also tell investors to look out and you, you start using credit unions. The government sponsored eight credit and unions are the, the the play right now. They really are. SBL, Freddie SBL is out for those, you know, 50 to 100 unit deals. Uh, community banks kind of getting rocked right now. Credit unions, that's a that's a great tip, you know. Just and yeah, the government that. sponsored entities, the GSCs, the Fannies, the Freddies, like Jake's talking about, they want 50 to 55% LTVs, whereas a year ago they were at 70%. So they're still lending, but they're being very, we're very, doing three very, refis at 55% LTV right now. Yeah. But that's what it is. But I mean, most people can't make a deal work at 55% LTV because yeah. all of a sudden there's not much cash on cash return. They got to come up with a ton of money to put down in these deals. So just be wary of what's going on. And but that, our spread wow. is 149 basis points. Which is awesome, but then Jake, the thing the thing that people have to understand is debt is a circulatory engine of the economy. This is how they slow the economy down. They make debt more expensive. They make the cost of capital more expensive. So as it's harder to you know finance these assets, even though there's a ton of money out there, you're slowing the economy down. And don't kid yourselves out there, everybody. The real estate residential market has reset. Pricing here in St. Augustine, which is one of the hottest markets in the country, prices have come down here 20%. And assets are staying on the market a lot longer. They're being priced incorrectly. So that's going on here. I can imagine in middle America and markets that are a little bit slower, that are losing population, are seeing even more significant uh, declines in asset prices. And I think that will continue. And I think construction costs are going to be are going to be much higher. Labor is still a little bit more challenging. Those costs, it's going to be harder to start building. I have a lot of assets coming online. So as we talk Talk about that. Is that going to affect uh, inflation, Jake? I know you had a couple of questions to uh, to shoot at me. Go ahead. Yeah, before before we transition to that, for those that know, for those in the business, this is the time. You have, yes. I would say, seventy five percent of the people competing for the deals. I, I think seventy five percent of the people have have fallen out of the market. They call it pencils down. They're not even underwriting deals right now. We're seeing a drastic drop off in people competing for deals right now, and therefore, uh, you're you're able to kind of get in and uh, and get some really good deals done. Uh, we're having a much more successful year from the amount of units acquired, the amount of deal flow that we're doing this year compared to last year, and compared to the prior year, and, and probably the prior year from there. So, uh, fantastic time in 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 my humble opinion, from what we're doing to be multifamily invest investors. You know, pedal to the metal and. Uh, we're scooping up as much stuff as we can right now. So just love, love this market. A little, uh, you know, a little contradictory to probably what uh, you're hearing out there in the news. But this is, to me, this is go time. I'm not going to miss this uh, opportunity. But uh, one of our producers, Russ, uh, has been pushing us to do a subreddit. So he's uh, he sent me some information here. He's got uh, the Jake and Gino subreddit. It's uh, real estate investing, and you know he's been getting questions there from uh, from different investors. So we said, okay, Rusty, boom, boom, we're gonna get you. We're gonna give you a shout out today. We're gonna get these questions answered. So uh, a few things, and uh, and I thought this one was interesting. We've never got this one before. Gino, would you invest in a in a multifamily asset that's in a bad school zone? Uh, and and typically that's not been a huge uh, buy right criteria for so so go ahead and answer that and i'll give my uh, two cents on it shout out to my wife julia she tried to call us on the phone right now and then she sees jake on live on facebook so she, she goes said, that's facebook. where my husband is he's <laughs> hanging out with jakey poo when he's got his little uh teal shirt on i'll leave him be for a minute <laughs> and then she you says, know, you're gonna get the grill going what is it you know she, honey you want an espresso what was the question but she says jake doesn't want to talk about politics i said jake never wants to talk about politics and that's okay Julia, he'll take an espresso <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a tough question for us to answer because everyone's buy right criteria is different. What I would do is I would look at median income. I mean, that that's one of the yeah. gauges for us. If the median income is sub $40,000, 
that may be a more challenging environment. As if you're used to working with that resident base, it's great. You need to worry about the price per unit, though. These these assets in these lower median income areas have a lot of deferred maintenance on these properties. They can work, but you just have to buy them at the right prices. And what's going on right now over the last few years, those assets were considerably higher in price than what they should have been. So you're paying a premium, plus you need to actually spend thousands and thousands of dollars on these CapEx requirements. So you're at, a, at, a, at an after repair value that's higher than you want to be. And then you have t- tenants or residents that are challenging, that are, 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 are more difficult to collect rent from. So I would look at the school zone. And I think school zones and median income probably mirror each other. If you've got a pretty good median income, 50,000 and above, I'm assuming that the school zone may be a little bit better. I've seen some contradictions. Yeah, I've seen some contradictions there in the past, but I I do tend to agree with you. Uh, Sometimes you're going to get something that doesn't align like that, but I I completely agree with Gino. Uh, Median income uh, before school zone and then crime. I I think if you can make sure that- yeah, if you can make sure that you're in a in a in, a, in our experience again, we where we've had good median incomes and low crime, things tend to work out pretty well. Uh, school zone not being as as big of a deal because I think look, everyone's coming over to the dark side. They're doing homeschooling like me and the G Dad. They don't they don't need you know the government anymore for that uh, service, right? Take it in house, folks. All right, take your property management in house, take your schooling in house, and in the world. And, and Jake, I think that may be the mentality of the residential investor where they're saying to themselves, "Hey, it's time out. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to resell this house. You, you're renting, so I mean, like you may not even have kids. Who I mean, like who are you actually renting to? Your demographic? Are you renting to seniors? Are you renting to college students? Are you renting to people who don't have kids? Then that's not even an issue. You don't even have to worry about school districts there. That's when I really focus on median income more than the school districts. Yeah. And then we got uh, uh, William, Billy Flanagan. Um, it's not an Irish guy, right? He says, uh, how to transition from a passive investor to an active investor. Uh, I don't know. You want to just maybe share your story because you know nothing better than what you actually did there, Gino. Shameless plug. Jake and Gino.com forward slash apply. Come and work with. There's the roadmap, work. right? Take the, yes, right. take the yellow brick road. And, yeah. and this is important. Come, come and work with, with our team. I mean, we've got great business advisors. We've got great coaches. Our students have closed over 70,000 units, over $4 billion. We have over 100 students who have left their W 2 jobs. And, and, you know, why do I start off with that? Because I think it's really important. When I started my journey, I made a ton of mistakes before I met Jake. And I realized I need to learn from people actually doing it. Success leaves clues. You are either going to pay on the street or in the classroom. In the classroom, it's a lot cheaper and you go a lot faster and a lot quicker. So for you, if you're a passive investor, what I think you need to do is I think you need number one to ask yourself, why do you want to become active? I mean, what's the goal? Is it the goal to leave your W-2 job and transition into, into the into the business full time? Let's say it is. I can share with you what, what Jake and I did. What we decided to do was we bought our first couple of deals. We bought them within our market. Jake was living in the market. All of a sudden, he decided to say to himself, I'm going to start managing these assets myself. I'm going to start collecting the property management fee. Great. All of a sudden, so you have two, two layers of... Uh, revenue coming in. You have the owner draws from the properties. You have the asset and the property management fee coming in. That's what we did. And then we continue to buy these deals. Instead of actually pulling the money out of these deals and and living off the money, we deferred it. We actually put it back into the that next- That was the deal. fuel for the future fires. That's right. Exactly. And one of our coaches basically said, hey, it's great to quit your job and go full time. But if you do that early on, you may be hurting yourself in the long run because you need that money to live short term. If you can keep your W-2 job. Listen, I, I bought my first deal with Jake. Within five years, I left my uh, restaurant. But I had those three or four years in between where I was still making money from the restaurant, able to live, live off that money. And then with Jake, all the profits and all the money from the real estate business was going back into the real estate business. But if you're going from passive to active, first thing you need to do, get a mentor, start educating yourself as if you are going to do the business full-time, learn how to write deals. You need to select the market. You need to figure out what your buy right criteria is. You have to learn how to asset manage, property manage, start doing that as you're as you're you know learning the business through a mentorship program. And, and joining a mentorship program is also, you know, you're going to be you're working with a lot of people within the community. We have hundreds of students in our community where you want to network and you want to be held, you want to be held accountable. So I think that's where you need to start focusing. Yeah, our first event that we do for any new students coming into the community, it's called our Buy Right event. And the, and the first thing that we teach everybody is, is basically what not to buy. And as you're starting to sift through these deals, you're going to reject the majority of them. And, and that's the key because no deal is better than a bad deal. So the key mm-hmm. is to find what deals suck, get them off your plate. And, and 
a part of that same process is what we call discovering your buy right criteria. Uh, we wrote about it in our f- first book, Wheelbarrow Profits, and ultimately setting up criteria that gives you a green light to go, a yellow light to dive deeper, and a red light to say no. Because the quicker you can sift and get junk off your desk, the better off you're going to be because you don't want those deals are going to hurt you and hold you back. One of the, one of the things that we've learned from our experience in, in you know, buying over 2000 units is that you could have one deal in your portfolio that's taken up 90% of your time from a management perspective, because mm-hmm. it's one of these, these alligators that's trying to eat you alive. That's the kind of stuff that we want to avoid because it's going to make your experience as an investor terrible. Um, it's, it's funny that you're talking about kind of deferring uh, the the fun stuff for later on. The guy that was actually uh, here doing, he, he does our pool, uh, you know, weekly come out, go out and clean it, whatever. He was like, I just came into like $150,000. I felt like uh, a Wilson from uh, that old Tim Allen show. What was it where he did like the fixer up stuff? What was it? Home improvement? Home improvements. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, he's like asking me a question through the window. So I'm like looking over the fence like this. And he's like, I just came into $150,000. We sold my house. I'm like, cool, man. He's like, I'm looking around and this house is great. How do I create wealth? I'm like, oh, dude, how much time we got here, right? So I, <laughs> I ran, I got him a copy of the Honey Bee. I got him a copy of Wilbur Province. And I said, dude, don't go buy another house just yet. Find a vehicle that you can put the money in that's going to grow, okay? Get assets over liabilities, defer the toys, all right? Toys are great. It's, it's fun to go out and get the Ferrari and get the jet, but don't focus on that right away. Focus on growing the cash flow snowball over time. Gino, we're going kind of long. I got more questions. You want to keep going, or, or what one, do you more. Want to, one more? One more question. All right, and then and then you get the espresso, and she'll uh, she'll mail me one up to Knoxville. Here is that what's happening? Absolutely, bro. FedEx. All right. Thanks. So here here's an interesting one. Eyes like Emerald City. That user eyes like Emerald City. Don't know much about Reddit yet. We're we're just learning here. Uh, but this is a great one. Should I use my 401k to invest in a property? Okay, legal disclaimer, because Gino is a bull and I, I don't want to make any of it. We will not ever tell you what to do. We'll just share our own experiences. Legal disclaimer. Uh, go ahead, Gino. Not going to tell you what to do with your money, but we could, we could talk about our experiences. There's a couple of ways that you could use your 401k. The first way is what Jake and I did. We both blew up our 401ks. And with personal experience, I had $100,000 in the deal in my 401k. And at the time I was getting cost segregation from my assets. So I was able to wipe off any active income versus the the active losses. So I pulled $100,000 out. I paid a 10% penalty. So I was left with 90,000. I put that $90,000 into our 156 unit deal that we bought back in uh, August of 2014. We could close actually. It was we we put that on the contract in August, close in January, and that was probably one of the best investments I've ever made in my life. So when people are saying to you, "Oh, it's really unwise to do that," the return on capital, I mean, is just. We had two students Cross on seg baby. That's all I gotta say. We, well, we had two students on the closest club the other night. Vanessa, Michael Sanchez. They used three hundred forty thousand dollars out of their four hundred one k. They pulled it out. They paid their taxes. They created eight hundred thousand dollars in equity in 18 months. I mean, just try doing that with your 401k. It'll take you 30 years. They did it in 18 months, but only if you know how to invest in real estate, only if you have the skill to do that, would you do that? I didn't do that early on. Don't do it at the gates. Get a, get a couple deals under your belt, prove it first to yourself before. Yeah. And Jake, the other way to do it is if you want to invest passively, like that first question, open up a self-directed IRA. If you want more information on a self-directed IRA, email me, Gino at jakeandgino.com. I'll hook you up with Scott. Scott's the guy who takes care of all the Jake and Gino students. It's a great way to invest passively using using uh, an IRA. You can direct it yourself. The funds get directed by you and you're able to invest as a passive investor. One last thing, jakeandgino.com forward slash webinar. We host a monthly webinar every single month on a different topic. Go there, register at that link for the next month's webinar. You can also watch the previous month's webinar. All right. So he didn't do it, but I'm going to do it. So so Russ has got us with kid gloves today. He, he left us some notes. He says, at the end, let the audience know if they post questions at Jake Gino subreddit, uh, shared in the description. So shared in, in, in this link, uh, we'll be able to answer them on uh, on future Facebook, YouTube, whatever, whatever uh, medium they're putting us out there on. So Russ, we got you, bro. Gino, he's giving me the finger, but that's the one finger because he's got something to say. What's up, man? I'm Gino. He's Jake. We're Jake and Gino, and we are real people doing real deals. I always wanted to end it, baby. You always ended it. I ended it this time. How about that? Dude, and, and, I, and I followed uh, the direction that uh, that he gave to us, so we're being good boys today, yes. right? Thanks, Enjoy brother. Espresso. See you, Julia. <laughs>